Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is January 2nd, 2013, and um, we're just getting into the new year. Kind of uh, decided to have uh, informal conversations here and uh, around P2PU. Karen Fassenpower uh, is starting some uh, new study group for young people, um, and so we're, we thought we'd, that was one idea. Um, where that we could talk about your online makerspace um, and PDPU in general, and I could maybe talk about how it's going a little bit on PDPU as well. And um, Tim Burke and I have just met over a couple of emails um, because I've gotten real excited about Guru recently, uh, Guru for Learning, Guru Learning .org. Um, and Tim is starting to help me plan a show on the 16th where some teachers who are using Guru will come. So he asked, you know, and thought maybe, what if I just come this week and for the more informal talk? So welcome, Tim Burke as well. And Terry Elliott um, just uh, uh, told me a secret, which is that doesn't start. I'm not supposed to tell him about that. doesn't start <laughs> for a few weeks. So uh, we're, we're it's <laughs> wonderful that he's able to join us. As Karen said back to him, she, um, and I feel the same way, we love talking to Terry whenever we get a chance. So, Welcome, everybody. Um, why don't you all go around and do your own introductions now and, um, and say what's on your mind a little bit, starting with you, Karen. <laughs> well, I'm Karen, and I'm happy to be here. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy and I'm happy, that, I'm happy that Tim is here because I've had Guru Learning on my radar to check out, so... And I just haven't done anything about it, but I'm excited to hear about it. And I just put the January 16th show on my calendar too. So very cool. And there comes Paul. Oh, very cool. So Karen, can you say uh, as you introduce hey, yourself? And I, I, I would love to get into this a little bit because, and Tim, you can uh, represent this in some way. But I, one of the things we're open open free sources kinds of things but could you say a little bit about your history in that and just uh, and and your passions about it yeah Me? Karen yeah. Yeah, yeah Karen we'll get to guru later <laughs> yeah I've worked in um, uh, the open education area for about the last four or five years and mostly um, I work with open content open licensed content um, which is for those who don't know content that's licensed in a way that it can be freely not only freely used but also redistributed and remixed um, and I got into it through working with um, students doing multimedia work mostly creating podcasts and creating ebooks and stuff and looking for ways that we could put music and other multimedia um, in in a way that was legal because I'm I always try to sort of pay attention to copyright things um, mm -hmm. And as we're trying to get students to publish more and more publicly, I think my own interpretation of fair use is that um, a lot of people are skating on thin ice in terms of what the law says. And it used to be that there weren't really any options for that, but then when Creative Commons and all the um, sort of open licenses came along, now there's so much content out there um, that that you can do whatever you want with. And so that was kind of what I, how I started getting involved in the open space. And then I think since then, um, my interest in it has grown and really expanded um, from not just sort of looking at it as some building blocks we could build cool stuff to, but really thinking about it as a way that, um, that I think really education can change and also um, a way to really um, promote and advance teacher professionalism through sharing and sort of taking taking back control of um, our curriculum. Hmm. So I, I bet that Tim that that fits some of your work at Guru as well. But do you, um, Paul, oh, we'll get to introduce you here in a second. But Tim, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Guru and how yes. that fits open source and or open, that's not even the right word, right? Say it for me again. Open 
Open licensed, open typically. Licensed. And, and the difference is open source. I mean, a lot of people call yeah. open content, they say open source because everybody knows what that means. And so mm -hmm. it kind of yeah. well, is understood. Mm -hmm. But I think the technical difference is that open source belongs to more like, a, it, it applies more to software that's created by a group. And the license is to the community. Whereas content, and Tim, surely feel free to jump in and say otherwise, but typically open content, the person who creates it owns the, owns the copyright, but then the license is to everybody to share. So this is a, like a weird introduction to you all, but that's okay. We're, I'm, I hope it's okay. We're, we're, we're letting this conversation happen however it happens. So Tim, well, sure, sure. introduce um, yourself a bit, yeah. So I'm relatively new to um, the open educational resources movement, the OER content. Um, I came um, as a teacher, Paul, actually in the South Bronx is where I started working oh. um, at CS73 as an elementary school teacher. And, um, you know, my first experience with that with computers and technology in the classroom was just through one computer in the back and, you know, a, a program, Starfall Learning. Dot org, you know, which was where my second graders would get on and practice their alphabet, and um, it really opened up the door for me to start differentiating and allowing um, myself to be freed up to both small groups. So I started exploring the idea more and more with teaching. Um, I eventually transitioned to the charter space in New York with Uncommon Schools, and we ran uh, a full blended learning model with another program that's pretty outdated at this point, but. Uh, it was Waterford reading, and um, you know we were rotating through groups of uh, students of about six or so per group for periods of an hour and thirty minutes, um, which really allowed me to drive down into each of my students' individual needs. Um, hmm. Long story short, transitioned to working uh, in some New York charter schools in Red Hook in Brooklyn, um, and helped uh, found a, a school called Pave Academy as a curriculum director there uh, before transitioning out to working with Aspire Public Schools in the Bay Area. Um, I, tr I transitioned out of the class uh, to, to work with Aspire as the Dean of Students um, in the Vice Principal role essentially and in my third year there I sat down with my principal and I said I'm dying to get back in the classroom and teach. Like, What can I do? How can I support? Now, I had an advisory class but wanted something a little bit more formal. Um, with a, some structure to it, to just connect with with students on a different note. And this past year, um, I, I was able, I taught I taught a Spanish elective group for seventh and eighth graders. Um, Ninety percent mm -hmm. of whom uh, are English language learners, and Spanish is their first language. And here I am teaching uh, Spanish to them. But um, because it was an elective class, I had the opportunity to kind of explore and play with things. And we had a computer lab which, like many schools in the area, kind of sat unused for most of the day. Uh, and especially in the period that I taught, first period in the morning, I thought, I'm going to explore and, and play around with this opportunity to, to get into the lab and to really differentiate um, to meet my students' needs. I had, you know, probably about seven or eight students in each class that had zero language with, with Spanish and no, no background. Um, and so I started, uh, we started with a project where I had them doing some research. They were studying Latin American dictators, and I came across um, Guru, and I started playing with it and toying with it, and then put it into the hands of my students. I had them start building and creating. They, they were pretty well versed in PowerPoint, but beyond from that, that was kind of the tech expectation, is that you can use PowerPoint, you can kind of search online, and there was so much more to it than that. And when I walked through this, students through the tool uh, and kind of allowed them to start critiquing each other on what was an appropriate presentation, what was, a, what was an engaging one. Uh, they kind of came up and designed a rubric where they were able to e evaluate each other's presentations that they shared out in Guru as a, as a link to one another so that when they actually got up and presented, the students study, who had studied them came prepared with questions and they dug deeper, they wanted to know more. You know, why was Pinochet, you know, liked by some Chileans and not liked versus others? And it just became a really rich tool um, that just opened me up. You know, this was maybe last February, and I thought, I want to reach out to these folks over at Guru and figure out really what, what's going on. 
So I started, sure enough, Guru was right down the block, about 10 minute drive from my last school in East Palo Alto. And so I started volunteering. Um, after work, I'd drive over from about 5 till 8 o'clock or so and, and see just a team of engineers kind of creating, but co-creating. And you know, the work that I'm doing now is realizing that we need that feedback from teachers who are in the classroom daily, like yourself, Paul, who are using the tool and can teach us you know, the ways in which it's working and the ways in which um, you're, we're able to get students to become eventually more self-directed with their own learning. And, you know, the, the ultimate goal is giving it back to the students for them to be creators and makers, um, kind of like concept of the maker fair. So my team and I will bring teachers right, you know, to an introduction to some using tech in the classroom to others who are well-versed and, and looking for the next thing um, especially a platform that is free and open, and when when we say that teachers initially hear well, free and open, you know, I, I've heard that before, but when we say uh, free and always going to be free, that kind of catches them back and thinks, well, wait, you know, may, maybe this space is actually shifting now, and I can be, you know, I can trust that it's not going to be a freemium after a month or two that you're going to ask me to start paying, you know, a service of thirty dollars a month or ten dollars a month, what have you. So um, yeah, we're, so we're, we should get into some of that. Yeah, yeah, um, as we go here. But th thank you for that story. I'm glad we asked. <laughs> it was a really detailed, wonderful. It's kind of a it's no, kind of it's a great narrative. Um, and and I wish all people working at Guru had that same narrative. I'm sure some do. But and and places like that. So it's great to have a teacher where you are. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's wonderful. Sure. What's what's your what's your uh, role there now? What do you so my role, my, my official kind of title is the Director of School Partnerships. Um, so what that means is everything from outreach about Guru to running and managing what we call our Guru Labs, where we're in schools in the Bay Area helping co-create and co-design content for teachers, um, showing them tools. You know, and we're not just solely focused here at Guru. We're really about how a tool like ours can be leveraged, but also incorporated with other tools out there. Paul, you use... Crocodoc, and, and that's that's an amazing uh, insight into how we can start leveraging Guru in a writing classroom, or you have mm -hmm. Google Hangout, or Google Quizzes, Google um, Moderator. You know, to be able to use other tools to continue the learning either outside of class or to um, personalize it during class for teachers who, you know, are, are maybe treading in in the water, but they're not quite ready to take that leap themselves. So we're we're kind of the training wheels until teachers are ready to pull off and, and run with it themselves. Cool. Uh, Paul O, oh, you just jumped in just after I said everybody's name, but from, from the National Writing Project, I think uh, most people know, but uh, talk about yourself a little bit and um, tell us what's exciting to you right now. <laughs> Welcome. Sure. Thanks for coming by. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I am always happy to uh, to be on Teachers Teaching Teachers, and um, especially grateful when I get invitations from you and Karen to, to, to be on to talk about uh, what I'm not exactly sure yet. <laughs> I will say that I'll figure it out uh, in about yes, three minutes. <laughs> that's fantastic, and I'm I'm excited to help figure that out. Okay. So. I am a senior program associate with the National Writing Project. We're based actually in the Bay Area as well. We're based in Berkeley. And um, what's exciting lately or what's exciting to me lately, uh, I think one of the things that I have been uh, really thinking a lot about is, um, is this idea of you know, how teachers make this leap from essentially not using uh, the digital tools that may be available to them um, to then actually using those digital tools. And I feel like that, uh, that leap is, um, is talked about, but I'm not sure how closely it's been examined. And I think I've talked to you a little bit about this, Paul, because I feel like, um, you know, what I, I think one of the elements in my mind is this um, is, is something that closely aligns with you know the ideology around making, um, which is this idea of tinkering, and uh, the ethos of tinkering. Uh, so I think I've just really been thinking a lot about um, how to how to encourage that 
that ethos of tinkering. And partly that comes from work that I'm doing actually in the Oakland Public Schools as part of a grant, a uh, civic, digital civic engagement grant that the National Writing Project is is involved with. Um, it's you know mainly being led by teachers at Oakland Unified, but uh, another of our partners is the Center for, I'm sorry, the Civic Engagement Research Group at Mills College. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the things. There are a million other things that are going on that I think are exciting. Um, Educon's coming up, and we're, we're going to be doing some work with um, Mozilla at Educon. Um, you know, they have an open news initiative, which I think is really uh, pretty fascinating. And a lot of um, Mozilla's push has been into this idea of, of um, web literacies and uh, making uh, web authorship in some ways um, transparent um, and open. So, yeah, um, those are just a couple of things. And then a and little word, bit further down keeps there. coming up. <laughs> Open, yeah. yeah. A little bit further down the horizon, I would say, is uh, the digital, digital Media and Learning Conference. So that's happening in Chicago, and we're thinking about that as well. So lots of exciting things coming up. Terry, what's Terry Elliott? Introduce yourself a little bit, and um, yeah, what's going um, on with you right now? <laughs> well, right now I've got a full load of wood in the fire, and I've got a cup of coffee. And I'm good to go. Uh, I was in Louisville today with my daughters, and we spent the day walking in a cemetery. It was a wonderful experience. <laughs> um, I, I didn't think I'd get back in time, but I did. So uh, um, what I'm thinking about right now, uh, there, there are a bunch of areas that I'm interested in, and especially um, student-generated uh, work um, using technology which I'm really struggling with because a lot of the tools that I use uh, for say, like I use um, a tool, an app called Explain Everything, which is an iPad app that allows you to uh, do annotations of PDFs uh, that are, that will also record your voice. So you can pull up a PDF on an iPad and begin record and then you can mark up the uh, the PDF and talk at the same time. And uh, I've used that in my composition classes, and I've used it in my intro to lit classes. And I've used it for a lot of standard things. And but it's mostly me doing stuff to them. And what I want to do is I want them to do stuff for me for themselves, and I want them to generate their own content. Unfortunately, you know they don't have access to all the tools they need to do that. And I teach, I teach uh, composition, freshman composition, mostly to um, um, at-risk students and uh, at the freshman level at the university at Western Kentucky University. And um, they don't have the tools to do that. And I'm trying to figure out ways. Uh, one of the things I did last semester was instead of using uh, that tool, I used uh, another tool that was a, a cloud-based tool called Scoop It, which is a curation tool. And uh, mm -hmm. I got all the students to use that as um, kind of a, a, a pre-annotated bibliography. So students would go and collect information uh, and curate information, which is basically what any kind of research paper is, is curation mm -hmm. of information. And I would have them use Scoop It as their, their first line where they would gather information. And then from there, they had to summarize the content in, in a, and create an annotated bibliography, pretty standard uh, higher ed academic assignment. Uh, so, you know, I'm beginning to find ways to make these tools work. But the fact that, there, I mean, there's a, whole, there's a whole lot more of them that uh, are tied to an iPad or tied to an Android tablet or tied to something. And more and more of them have the tools, but um, and more and more of them are using smartphones. And uh, But still, I, I, you know, I come from an area that's fairly rural, and we have a lot of students who come to, I mean, paying for textbooks is a major deal for a lot of these students. I'm trying to get away from textbooks, you know, and that's that's a real struggle, too. So 
I'm moving, uh, you know, I'm looking for projects with my students that enable them to use the tools that I'm using because I've found that they work and they really help me learn. And I'm just assuming that it will help them learn too as they generate content. I believe seriously in user-generated content. And that means student-generated content. And student, everything about it, you know, rising up from the student level. You know, that's what they call folksonomy, yeah. right? So, but there, so there seems to be some struggle there between wanting, like, I don't know. It, it's kind of funny to say you want student-generated work, but there you're asking them to use tools that you yes. have learned on. Is that <laughs> yes. that's the yeah. struggle? <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it's it, that's part of the struggle, but uh, mm -hmm. that's really all I can go by is what you know the things that I believe that. Um, that you have to adapt and adopt, adopt and adapt tools first, and be a personal user before you can share them with other students. And sometimes it fails, right? And if it fails, it fails. That's just the way that goes. Um, but I don't know any other way to do it other than to, uh, you know, try it this way. So any help at all I could get from you all would be much appreciated. Cool. I, I, so. And I, I'm, I'm kind of jumping arbitrarily, but let's start with P2PU a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Is that okay, Karen? And but I'm as as I look at, at your online makerspace, I had very and and my own uh, work in P2PU, I have very similar questions. Like, how do we keep this student-centered, student-generated, yet uh, guide and provide I don't know, provide them the tools they need to. Or however you want to interpret that question. Well, when Terry was just talking, one of the things that that came to mind was the element of, of student choice and sort of could it work? And I've seen I've seen some some K twelve teachers do this well. It's not something I do well, but could it work to have the students choose their tool? either based on their, you know, sometimes it's based on previous experience and I think in a, where I've seen it work the best is where the, the community has had experience with a lot of things and they'll come in and say, oh, can we do this in Google Docs or can we do this in whatever? Um, but maybe even if not, you know, if you could set out the objectives, I think it's chaotic as a facilitator because, yes. you know, you have... 30 people doing different things, but I almost think in the kind of in the kind of world we live in with so many devices and so many operating systems, and it doesn't seem like that's going to shake out, that you we almost have to do some of that. I don't know. You know, if I could just jump in a second and say that in the P2PU uh, curation course that actually a number of us facilitated, Karen and Terry, um, I believe it was Terry Yu, in fact, who, who brought up that idea of possibly um, giving, you know, giving a group that is experimenting with curation tools the opportunity to choose a particular path, you know, and a particular tool, mm -hmm. and then come together and, and, and be able to, you know, talk about that experience, compare notes, maybe share, and, and I realize that it adds this layer to the process that that perhaps uh, you know makes the two cumbersome, and so the you know the, the the focus is less on the composition that you're attempting you know to have your students engage in and uh, you know to, to have the youth create, but I just thought that was a, a really interesting possibility and. And I would just say bringing this back to this idea of, um, you know, this like teacher leap as I was talking about earlier, you know, one thing that I saw in Oakland, and this may seem like a really simple, very basic thing, but, you know, we, we are working with a group of teachers and, you know, we gave them an opportunity to share some work that they're doing, you know, so I'll just leave it general like that. You know, and one, one piece of work had to do with, you know, using blogs. So, so in this very sort of basic, simple way, a teacher talked about how she set up blogs so that her students could begin to do research. And just having that experience of being in conversation with a group of other teachers who were then able to show, like, this is what, you know, uh, this is how I set it up and this is what I did, you know, really stimulated a number of other teachers. Actually, I should say not a number of others, but one other teacher to say, you know, I'm going to try this. Um, and 
you know, I, I mean, who knows what, what are the paths forward here, but, but, but the idea of experimenting and then being able to come back and share that experiment with a group, uh, you know, and, and reflect upon that experience does seem like a powerful possibility, you know, if you have, I suppose, the time and the wherewithal and the resources. And I, and I say that I think this because of you, Terry, in, in large measure. <laughs> And I'm glad you brought up the curation course because I hope we're all moving ahead with some curation idea this year on P2PU also. So. That's right. Exactly. We will. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. Karen, Karen can you, uh, for people who don't know about P2PU, could you kind of give us a basic introduction to that and then talk about your course a little more? And, and I, um, Tim, please interrupt at any point. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay feel free to. I just want to invite that. But. Karen. I will do that. And before I forget, I would love to hear Tim just give an overview of what exactly Guru does. Because I, he mm -hmm. talked about it sort of the context, but I think for people who haven't played with it, like what does it look like? Okay. So um, P2PU is an open um, peer learning space where anyone can learn about anything, anyone can start a course, anyone can participate in a course. It started out for um, primarily for adult learners and having nothing to do with teachers or education. There's a lot of stuff on there. Um, Mozilla Foundation is a partner in it and there's a lot on there on programming topics and everything else you can imagine from learning Japanese to knitting, cooking, whatever. Um, and so about two, a little less than two years ago, um, I came across P2PU and said, this is an awesome platform for teacher professional learning. Um, mostly as a part of my search for something, because I do a lot of very traditional, or I used to do, I'm not doing so much anymore as I'm going around bashing it, but um, <laughs> traditional professional development um, <laughs> and looking for alternative models to that, um, which P2PU seemed to be a great idea. And so, um, Everybody in this group has participated in different courses we've done. We did a great course on curation. Um, uh, National Writing Project has done several projects. Um, and what I am working on right now, and it's very much in the, I don't know. One thing I love about P2PU is you kind of brainstorm as you go, and it forms itself. And I've gotten much, I think it's been a good learning experience for me because I'm a very, like, I want to have an outline. I want to know what everybody's doing every week and, you know, readings and assignments. And that's not really P2PU. It's more like get a group of people together and sort of explore something together. Um, and it's, I think that sometimes is a challenging model, but it's just amazing and it, it, it started, like, we've really got some people now that it's really going that way and going great. So um, the thing that I'm working on right now is a youth maker space. Um, and it, the idea is just, I mean, there, the idea is a couple things. One is to have, I, I really believe in the maker sort of idea um, as a student learning tool, um, really to empower the personal choice that we we're talking about and I think that you can learn reading and writing and math in pretty much any context so why not apply it to something that students are interested in and that they choose um, and that seems like a lot of what the maker thing is about um, so the way it's set up right now is there's just a pretty general outline of categories of things you could make. So there's a digital storytelling section, there's a section on food and cooking, there's a section on apps and digital spaces which could be things like making mobile apps or it could be Scratch or it could be GameStar Mechanic or whatever else I'm missing. Or it um, could be build, building a robot if you have that stuff around. Yeah, or, there's actually a separate section or, on gadgets and robots. Okay. Which okay. also includes like I mean, all kinds so it's of making things. it's making stuff online. Yeah, that, well, or, I mean, or, the whole online digitally. piece is kind of yeah. It, because obviously, to make stuff, with the exception, I would say, of digital spaces and digital stories, you're ma a lot of the stuff you're making something physical. And I think my idea of the digital sp digital makerspace, and we'll see if this works or not, or how it works over time, but. 
part of my idea was even if you're making something yourself sort of physically to have a group of people to talk about it to have a place to get ideas um, and and possibly down the road to have some sort of mentors in certain areas and certainly this isn't unique like a lot of other people are doing things like this and actually we're pulling a lot of um, content from people like DIY.org and um, instructables and so that's kind of a place we're saying like here's stuff you can you can go out and find and what I'm what I'm hoping and I think this is going to take so you're time. curating curriculum right exactly I mean, exactly we, we don't have to overuse that word tonight but yeah. I like it go ahead I like it <laughs> okay what I'm hoping over time is is I think that the strength of P2PU is in building a community and sort of having a group of people to, to bounce things off of and I'm hoping that that could be applied to the maker space because I, I love like the first maker fair I went to I was so excited but I too live in a very rural area so the closest maker fair to me was like an eight-hour drive and <laughs> I just think about all these people who should have this experience who are never going to go to a maker fair and that was kind of the impetus behind this online mm -hmm. space I don't know uh, if I could say something Karen um, it reminds me a little bit of uh, of the guy uh, in India, Sigata Mitra, who did the uh, the computer in the wall. Are you familiar with that? He just really. put a computer in a wall in a, a very very rural Indian village, and did, gave no instructions for its use, and uh, just turned the kids loose on it, made it fairly indestructible. And within a week or two, they were all using it, and they knew how to use it. Mm -hmm. And then he he expanded the program to what he I, I think he called him his grandmas, and what he did was he paired up um, uh, some of these uh, some of these computers and users kids in with um, with not just grandmas you know just it's retired people, and their goal was not to be tech experts as, as such. It was great if they had some tech expertise, but their goal was to be encouragers and uh, you know questioners and to and it seems to me that if you had somebody you know you had people like that who were you know tied into your program and maybe maybe some sort of partnerships with you know pilot partnerships with libraries because public libraries because I think that's where and especially in larger cities there's lots of maker spaces being and we were considering a maker space at our university too. I've been trying to push it really hard. That's so cool. Mm. But I, maybe I misheard you. But what, is it possible, though, right now that, uh, like, in your online maker space, people, adults, could sign up to be mentors of some sort? Yes, um, and there's and Terry. Which one would you do? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I think I would actually have both roles um, because, uh, you know, if it's an area that I'm not all that familiar with, I'm, I tend to be a learner. Like, I do, a pro yeah. I do um, eye searches with students every semester. And these are great because they get total, total discretion over what kind of questions they want to ask. And I usually do one myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm not an expert in any of these areas usually and uh, they simply answer questions and they answer a research question and I'm a learner along with them on the on these I mean as far as composition and how to organize it and write it I'm not but as far as content is concerned yeah I'm very much a um, they're the expert and I'm the you know the dude can I can I uh, jump right away and say uh, Tim you can get in on this a little bit but one I have no idea why you guys haven't um, expanded into English language arts yet um, I mean your 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 focus on math science and social studies so far is that, I think that's correct uh, but one of the one of the quick ideas because uh, uh, we I do a lot of inquiry with kids too is I wondered if you knew that English teachers like our content is this inquiry stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's a little... So, anyway. Yeah. yeah. You know, Point I, made, I think. A, lot yeah. of, a lot of points were brought up. I think, you know, uh, Paul, to revert, revert back to this concept of this um, leap that happens in this kind of space, I think 
uh, a quote that I recently heard that I, that I use with teachers who are making that leap is that if you don't know anything about tech, uh, you know, don't worry about jumping in because next week it's going to change and you'll just be right at square one. And kind of knowing that that um, that concept allowed me to kind of start taking steps. And actually, I was kind of pushed to to even start innovating because I knew the students would be able to support me with that process. And a, a question that I think comes up is that when when the students are just as in depth adept of using the tool even more than the teacher, that becomes kind of the power is inverted in the classroom. And I think a lot of teachers struggle with that concept to let the students kind of really run with it and um, see what they can come up and create with. But once they do, that's really when we know the magic happens. Um, I, you know, when I was running this project, I had two students that were able to pick up using Guru and sharing with their classmates much faster than, uh, than I kind of, um, it took me maybe a month to kind of get it, you know, really skilled in using it and it took these guys about three days. Um, but, you know, just to, Karen, I'm going to give you an overview. Guru was started, um, kind of brought up in the idea that OER should be um, open and free and, easy, you know, it is out there and it exists in various places, but as you know, searching in Google is like, you know, someone said taking a drink out of a fire hydrant and um, it, it can just overwhelm you if you're a teacher searching for this content to use. And so. Um, Prasad Ram started um, in, in his 20% time while working in, at Google in India. He was uh, leading the research and de design team there um, where some of his projects came under, they, they developed Google Maps, um, he developed some stuff for Google Marketplace, and in his 20% time he started this guru concept and um, started organizing OER content and it started with math and science particularly because those can be translated across the world. Um, and that there was kind of a, a clear taxonomy that teachers followed that um, he could start pulling resources into. And, and Prom also was an engineer, and so it kind of naturally led to, to that being the first step. And he ran a pilot with about a thousand students across um, five different schools in, in India with teachers curating resources and actually teaching um, lessons from Los Angeles. And he ran it in about three different types of school, a middle income school, a school where uh, complete poverty with really just an internet connection and one computer, and about 40 students kind of huddling around the speakers and taking turns. And then a school that uh, was affluent in, in Delhi and had, you know, um, computers for, for each student during the class time. And what he found was just astoundingly um, that, this t that the tech resources were like super glue for student attention. And, um, he kind of decided that he wanted to, to leave Google and came back to the Bay Area here and started building Guru uh, with just one other person, a, a colleague of his that he had worked with in India. Um, and essentially what we are is we're, we're a search engine, you know, and, and, it's not, and it's nuts and bolts for free OER content. It started with 5th through 12th grade math and science and then expanded on to social studies and are soon going to be incorporating English language arts. Um, but from that, teachers can also then take those resources and start building their own, what we call collections, like digital lessons, where they can start with a YouTube video, uh, and then they can go on to an open source textbook, um, highlighting maybe two chapters from a CK12 book. And then they can follow up with a Google quiz that they create, or um, a Google moderator form, or uh, a website. Um, and kind of combining a mix and match of various OER resources that kind of become a playlist, so to speak, for, for learning. Do, um, um, do they have to be OER resources? Uh, the, the, ones, the ones that are within our library and taxonomy are, are all free and open. Um, but again, it, it is kind of fair use and around this open license. Um, so how do, you, how do you deal with that? It's a tricky, it's a tricky space. You know, we're, yeah. we're a nonprofit, and, and so, um, envisioning that someone might might come down and, and sue us for using that is it's a possibility but one that we hope people will find in their, their heart of hearts to to not as we, we you know there are sites like the New York Times for example that um, are frame breakers when you try to put them in, in the guru iframe I have noticed this yeah. yes so, that's my next email to you what's wrong with that yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wolfram Alfred as well 
And those are sites that just don't want their material iframed because they want the traffic to be driven right to their site. But what we do is we don't we don't house any of the content from within Guru. We just simply link out to it. And so it, it also does bring traffic to, to that resource. Um, the, the real benefit for my colleague who runs the content partners, what she talks about, is that it will bring your audience a lot further and bring your resources a lot further out. Um, there was a great program that we were doing some work with. Um, um, they created a, a curriculum around the movie Bully. Um, it, I'm blanking on the, the name of it right now. They, um, can't, I can't recall what the, what the organization was, but they had so many various sites and so many various links that they could even organize their own content within there. And so, in working with Guru, they were able, we were able to ingest their content and organize it in a clean way that then our users can can easily find and search for. So, you know, in its nutshell. Guru is that search engine. I think what, what I'm really excited about and seeing is when the teachers get to a point where they can release their students to it and they put it in the hands of the students and allow them to start creating and ex making expressions of their own based on you know a teacher's guideline and, and rubric for, for that project. Huh. I, I, this may go nowhere, but one of the things I wanted to identify with that, that I see is similar in P2PU and Guru <laughs> is um, is th the iterative process. Um, so that what you were saying earlier, Karen, about how you get something started and then you can build on it and other people can build on it too. I think I think that's an important thing I always look for in in like tools where curriculum gets presented collected. And the other the other is, and it's kind of connected, but is um, being able to, um, what's the word, uh, copy everything and, and, and make it your own. And I think both tools allow for that. Is that a couple of Yeah, so like to clone, to clone, clone something the word, yeah. and then be able to modify it. I think that's huge. Yeah. And you can do that in Guru too, right? You can clone another yeah. you, you can collection. Pre-existing collections that the teachers have created and make a copy. Keeping you know the original intact, but then also you can go and say, you know, my student learns best with this video, and I'm going to put that resource first, or I'm going to add these three quiz questions in as a check for understanding before students get started. Um, ideally, we want to get to a point where we can maybe have different pathways based on student responses. If there's a way that, you know, if you get three, mm -hmm. these three questions wrong, maybe you, you get led back to this collection to study as a precursor before you go on. I'm trying to come up with some adaptive learning in that sense. Connect, connected to that, um, if I could uh, rush in and say, <laughs> there's a, the, a a part of the tool that makes it different than than Pinterest, for example, or Learnist, is is the um, is the narrative, right? The narrative which allows me to also link back out to the PTPU stuff that where some of the assignments are. So so on each on each page, that narrative allows me to to put the assignment there. I would love, by the way, for that to be more obvious somehow, but that's some feedback right. I've given you guys already. Or at least at least make it an option, because I always have to keep telling my students, you see that bubble down there? Hit that thing. Um, that's where the assignment is to deal, deal with that. Exactly. And one more thought, as, as, you, as I'm, I'm, I still have the mic here for a second. Um, the, you, you mentioned how, uh, how Google is overwhelming. It's also um, underwhelming, I guess maybe you, <laughs> what? may imply that, but it allows me to, to be a little more selective and say, here are seven really good reviews of the Lincoln movie, which I have put up there, by the way. Um, choose three of them. Um, and there isn't a clear enough way to say, you know, you have to read this third one, but you don't have to read these three or something. I'd love for that kind of tool, too. But, um, but certainly the ability to kind of Select a, a subset of what's out there, and then give choice within that subset is is what is kind of exciting about the tool. I think we're, we're playing around with a tool called Spicy Nodes that um, allows you, in a sense, it's kind of like Prezi. You can hover over, and 
Guru right now in its state is, is very linear, linear. So you start at your first resource and then click next. And you can you can you can click on the what we call the right drawer and jump ahead to resources. But intuitively, students will just go next, next. And we're we're toying with the idea of creating a series of resources that students can kind of navigate uh, at their own and have that choice, have that choice from within. Maybe I'll start here and go there. Um, but all the while keeping you know the objective very clear, uh, and so what we're doing is starting with one resource, and then we might put a, sp a spicy node map in as a follow-up resource, and then from there allow guide students using narration to either hover over this concept or start at this concept using this type of resource, because um, that's how life happens. You know, you we, you might start maybe it sounds like that's how P2P kind of evolved. Um, as just an, an, a brainstorm that then organically leads to some really amazing, great creations and concepts that come out from that. So that, that's something that we're kind of torn with uh, on our content team as well. Lots of like mini micro labs that we have kind of happening as we're building, but also reflecting and learning and getting feedback from teachers and, and even teaching ourselves uh, using the tool. And, and trying to figure out what's the best way. You know, the, the jury's kind of out on how online learning is really driving um, self-directed, inquiry-based kind of lifelong learners. I know that's so cliche, but how are we ensuring that students are then going out and wanting to continue their learning? One question I'll ask students is I'll say they're they're using Guru in maybe a physics classroom, and I say. Have you ever used Guru, you know, for math resources, for your algebra class, or for your, you know, geometry class? And if they're answering yes, then I know that something about our tool is working for them on our platform for them to want to go continue to search. But oftentimes, we're seeing it as just teachers assign this collection or, um, you know, reference this, and the students are more receiving as opposed to actively pursuing knowledge. Terry, you wanted to ask something or say something? I am um, running around in my head this whole time is kind of like these separate universes of um, applications and tools. Like, uh, like Guru is its own little universe. And then you know, I was thinking of a, a way I used um, Google Docs this semester, last semester, because they added a new component called research. I don't know, have you all seen that? Mm -hmm. It's um, it, what it does is it allows you to write and research within this basically the same frame, uh, which my students liked a lot. And then there are things, there are tools like Storify, and which is a, a tremendous tool for telling a narrative. And you just look, just go to that site, and you'll see it's all about narrative. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, it would be great to have a P2PU course on how do you decide what repertoire to use in your classroom how do you go about because so many students so many teachers are and students too are overwhelmed by possibilities and um, they're not used to just break you know the notion of okay grabbing the, the, the closest adjacent thing to do the job technically and sometimes that's not the best tool, you know, sometimes, and I'm not asking for some sort of a matrix, but what would be really good would be to say, okay, I'm in the classroom, and this is the problem I am approaching, and how can I do this? And one of the, one of the flows might be towards no tech tool at all, yeah. or a, a non-technical tool that leads to a technical tool. And I find myself, you know, I've got a pretty good repertoire, and I kind of throw the get things together like Chris Weinberger talks about, you know, small tools loosely joined. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I get, I kind of get, uh, you know, chasing my tail with the tech stuff, and I, 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 I fall back on three by five cards and post-it notes, you know. What do you mean chasing your tail? What, what does, what? By that I mean, you know, what am I really doing, you know, in the classroom? What, what am I really focusing on? And a lot of times, I mean, you know, I've taught long enough to know how to do composition without a, without a computer, without any of this other stuff, or to use it in a one-computer class, one classroom like I did for when I taught high school. 
Um, uh, but then I think to myself, well, you know, my students, they've got to learn how to use some of these. That's one of the functions of my teaching is, is, to, is to show them how to build a repertoire. And I don't know how yes. to, I'm not quite sure how to do it myself. Yeah. I, I, guess I think that's that whole I thing, it. yeah, that whole thing you're talking about, I mean, that's a learning to learn skill. Mm -hmm. and, and if you, you know, you know, it's like we, we've talked so many times around here about how do you teach people just like problem solving, critical <laughs> thinking, like just the process. It's the same thing with what tool do you use, whether it's for teachers or for students. Like, how do you get that skill set? of knowing to just go find something or try something or and then just move ahead. So, yeah. so oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Terry. I, I was just going to say, you know, you've got mobile applications. When when do I know to to add a mobile app to the mix? Uh, which mobile app do I add because there's so, you know, there's I don't know. I I that's it seems like there are there are so many different uh, pieces, and I'm not quite sure how to decide which pieces to use when. And that's really the which piece to use when. That timing and that tempo is so important in the classroom. Yeah. So I I was just going to say a couple of things which I think are are uh, probably going to be disjointed. Um, that they they seem Those related in my head. <laughs> But the, the first thing I was going to say is that, you know, I know for myself, like, I feel like I'm relatively tech savvy, you know, um, and w one of the things that I've been trying to tackle for myself personally is, you know, what is a good t task list, you know, utility? And I have, like, a zillion on my phone, on my <laughs> computer, and I can never stick with any of them. Yeah. And I, so, so... I don't know if the question in my mind, for me at least, is what is the best tool at the right moment? Mm -hmm. um, it could simply be, you know, what is the... So I guess maybe what I'm saying is perhaps the most adjacent tool is the best tool simply because it's the one that actually you can wrap your mind around, you know, given the, you know, the plethora of possibilities. <laughs> but that said, I do think that you know, the idea of being exposed to the possibilities, and this is going back, I think, to your earlier point, Terry, so I might be contradicting myself, but, you know, being exposed to the plethora of possibilities is is really, I think, critically important. Like, I think back to some early days when Paul Allison and I, I were doing work around uh, these institutes in which, you know, the the general idea was to give teachers an opportunity to play with a variety of tools. Um, and... You know, I feel like that's that to me is part of the missing element in professional development is like this opportunity to play and then make determinations and come to sort of a reflective stance about the work that you've done. Uh, and then I'm going to say another thing, which may, which I think contradicts that a little bit too. And this is actually related to Guru. And you know, so w the way that I actually got to know Guru was through Leah Jensen, who Paul Allison now knows. And you know, Leah Jensen. That's that's who introduced today. me to Guru too. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. And so <laughs> Thanks, she's, you know, yes. Yeah, so she's a technology, um, you know, inter uh, she's a technology, a technologist in the Oakland Unified School District. And um, you know, and I think what she wants to do. So this is going back to what you were saying, Tim, about. So what does it mean if I see students using this tool in one context and not another? I mean, perhaps it means that students haven't haven't figured out a way to apply this in their own self-directed learning, and I think that's, you know, an accurate analysis. But it may also be that, you know, if, if we have individual classrooms that are doing particular pieces of work, uh, you know, it's not possible to build a sense of continuity or momentum. And this is not, to say, I mean, I'm not advocating for like a prescription of tools, you know, in a district. But I do have to say that, like, in talking to Leah, you know, she wants to bring Guru to the Oakland Unified School District to make that as a tool available so that, you know, a whole range of kids, possibly through from middle through high school, would have this opportunity to use this tool. And so then the idea of using that tool, you know, over time becomes more ingrained in part of, you know, their, their learning process. And so, so this is just to say that, you know, like, I think Leah has been really persuasive in Oakland up to this point. I mean, I don't know, you know, I'm like totally cheering her on, but, you know, around a whole range of things um, having to do with learning opportunities that involve, you know, the digital. 
and and I think one of those things is Guru. So like the the ability for her to get an administration buy-in as well, or for anyone to get you know like an administration buy-in, I think is another element to this whole conversation. I think that aspect of plot. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I just was going to say that um, where I've seen it kind of where I think come together, ultimately the goal for where it's at is not teachers teaching in silos and students learning in silos. I saw we worked with uh, a pretty privileged school down here called Castilea, which is a, a girls' school, <laughs> uh, private school. Where, you know, it looks nicer than most colleges. And but what, one thing they had the luxury to do, given um, a few months of their curriculum, was that they combined three different classes: a uh, algebra two, a physics class, and a world history class. And um, the girls started using Guru One to learn about uh, ancient timepieces. So across Islamic culture and um, Chinese culture, and then they learned in their algebra program, you know, the, the fundamentals of, of building that timepiece and how that works and what needs to be lined up. And then the physics classroom, how the laws of physics apply. And then the girls actually went and they started building their own timepieces to measure time, the nearest up, uh, up to a minute, which timepiece could do it the best. And they had a little kind of challenge from within that to see coopetition kind of mindset to see who, who could um, measure it. They're using their timepiece nearest to a minute, and uh, the the three concepts kind of all blended together in in, in real learning, in real life learning. That um, they were able to really see the purpose for behind, um, you know, using using those all those learning concepts. And so I think that's if we can push push it to using technology tools to bring together curriculum, to bring together concepts, and to bring together teachers who would be more likely to plan and to interact with one another than as you know during their class periods and their time and then pushing administrators like you said to creating schedules and spaces and opportunities even in small projects but opportunities to start doing that uh, that that I think is real exciting Karen I think that aspect of play that Paul brought up is so important and I think that ties together a lot of the things we've been talking about sort of starting with, you know, how do we get more people to want to make the jump into digital spaces? How do we make more people want to play? And I think, you know, then then you make, you can make the space and make the time for it, but you have to want to do it. And it seems like a lot of people maybe don't want to do that. And as, as kids get older, <laughs> they want to do it less. And I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, um, what Tim is talking about there, I think, I mean, it's something that um, National Writing Project's uh, Digital Is is doing with uh, P2PU. You know, there's a lot of cross-fertilization there. And it would be really good to have partnerships with groups like Guru and, and maybe two or three groups coming together just to show how you can cross the boundaries, how you can bring the Venn diagrams together, so to speak, and create something that's really, you know, different than the sum of its parts. And maybe that would be a project or a question or something like that. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see something like that. And maybe to show the benefits of it, because I think whether it's teachers sort of playing with this stuff or students, when you give that space, I think amazing things happen. And so one of, one of the things I'm hoping to work on this year is highlighting some of Paul Allison's work doing that and showing the benefits of, you know, we can play and great things can happen. We don't have to, you know, it's not, I think there's so, the accountability thing, there's so much fear right now that if we spend like 10 seconds playing, oh my God, the kids are going to fail some, something. And that's not the case. But we need to really highlight examples of where that's happening and how amazing it can be. Hey, you know, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say, um, based on Terry's idea, you know, I love this idea of like, say, an inquiry sprint, you know, that involved um, youth voices and guru, right? Yeah. Like, wouldn't that be cool? Okay, now you can say. What would that look like? <laughs> what would it look like? Well, here. I think that's for you to that's for you to figure out. Two, I, I I've got a I've got a few others cooking, but two that 
the guru has has graced and I've asked them to publish is is the Lincoln one. So if you go to guru and gurulearning.org and search for Lincoln, you'll find uh, the Lincoln one. But what's important is to click on the assignment at the in the bottom left corner because there are links there to the PDPU stuff that where the assignments are. And then there are links also to youth voices, so that the, like connecting all of that is kind of important. Then I, they they also publish one around um, Sandy Hook um, that I put together. So that's um, a couple of places to start messing around. Um, but again, what, what I think is important collect collecting is important, but annotating with what you want kids to do with that collection is mm -hmm. is is really vital I think um, and also I got to say um, and and with Terry here um, one of the things that's that I, I think was really important is the using the crocodoc um, format or and Terry the the thing you mentioned I want to check out was explain everything but but um, so that when you find a resource inside of Crocodile, uh, inside of Guru, that it's interactive feels like an important piece. Yeah. So that also the video, putting the video up in um, dialogues first, and then putting that inside of Guru is yeah. is a nice mashup, which you know creates that kind of dialogue. So those are some of the things that people can go play with, and uh, we can get feedback and see what's going on. Um, well, I really, I really like yeah. your collection on on the young lords, um, and yeah. and I was curious to hear um, what your students thought was in that. You know, giving them the autonomy to go and explore and do this. Um, I, I've done a little bit of, I've seen some of your work in your classrooms on on some blogs that you shared, but um, are all do all students work so autonomously? And Leah told me when I met with her that. She said the, your classroom was the real one to visit during that time and that students would be writing and working and then when they wanted to share something, they'd maybe take their headphones off and they'd check in with Leah and they'd be more than happy to talk about what they were doing. Yeah. And you know, that's a culture that I, you must have cultivated from the beginning of the year to get to the end. Well, yeah, yeah, but it is part of what, what Terry was talking about earlier. It's about you know, personal inquiry and, and, and allowing for that. And, mm -hmm. And choice, all that. But yeah, the, who was working on the Young Lords um, was somebody who was pretty enthusiastic and found some of his own resources, and, and so we co-created that. I, I wish that happened more, and, and that's what I'm kind of looking cool. for. But like, we're trying to build one around Malcolm X right now, and that student's less ready to co-create with me. So okay. I don't know what that moment is when when they can do that. But we've got one coming up on faith healing, which I'm looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. But I, I did I, I healed that student today and, and told him <laughs> that tried to get rid of his slothfulness, but sorry. Put your hand put your hand on the computer and exactly. uh, heal me. Heal me. You should yeah, bottle yeah. that elixir. Bottle that elixir. <laughs> Sell it off the back of a wagon. <laughs> anyway, once we get that one going, so yeah, I mean that's that's what I think is kind of really interesting is is when the students can start co-creating these these resources because like in the back of their head, hopefully they're also thinking about oh another student might use this resource too. Right. But, right. Um, but we're going to continue that conversation. Could I make a, a few quick notes? I'm sorry. Well, I'm gonna, thank you all for I, the time felt like it went really fast to me. But um, quick notes for next week, because we're doing two shows next week, just because we're crazy. Yeah, but but just because just because our friends in England um, who have been doing some work around uh, the Make Waves folks and uh, doing work around quad blogging can join us if we do it earlier. So we're going to do it at 5 p.m. Um, Eastern time, 3 p.m. Pacific time, which is like 10 o'clock out there, and I think it's 9 o'clock in Australia, so Sue Walters may join us too. So we're going to do a sh uh, continue a show that Gal Desler kind of pushed us into around quad blogging and blogging in elementary schools. Um, and then we got this cool show coming up around uh, it's a, around open sources again. Uh, Bill Fitzgerald's going to join us, George Mayo and Harry Costner, who are doing some remixing stuff at Educon. Um, so we'll do that at 9 o'clock. So, and then next week we have Guru coming back. So, um, Tim, 
invite a few teachers and we'll see what happens here. Is it <laughs> Thank next you all. Or the 16th? Uh, the week after that, the 16th. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah. So Great we got a well. busy January plan. We're looking forward to continuing these kinds of conversations. Thank you guys for uh, getting us started here. And uh, I feel like we didn't get in deep with anybody here, but thank you, anyhow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, too, Paul. Uh, Thanks, Paul. Should, should, uh, we always do an, on our I'll take, I forgot, uh, to thank Jeff Lebo and Dave Corbier, who uh, started us off at edtechtalk.com and uh, worldbridges.net. You can find us at teachersteachingteachers.org. And there is a YouTube channel where it goes up right away, too. Um, you can search around and find that. So thank you all. Good night. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Take care.